Well, I had a letter to answer, and I have no idea where the letter went to. Um, my son is getting into the habit of trying to help Daddy by, uh, you know, organizing my letters for me, and uh, his plan of organization is to stick them every which way. I'm just looking around here. I looked over there, and it, I don't know where it is. So I just got it recently, and I, just, I can remember the gist of it, so sorry I'm not reading it word for word, but... Uh, it was basically, could you please help me to understand the change from Old Testament to New Testament, in particular, the thing of putting people that are involved in sex perversion to death. Okay, so we're just going to do a quick little study on that. Not going to be real detailed because you don't really need a lot of detail for some things. Leviticus chapter 20 is where you're going to find this thing of the death penalty. There's other places throughout the Old Testament as well, but... Um, Leviticus chapter 20, uh, verse, I guess we'll start in verse 13, go down to verse 16. It says here, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Okay, so clearly sodomy, man and man together. Verse 14, And if a man take a wife and her mother, if it, it is wickedness, they shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast, and lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. Um, and you see that all through this thing. There's even adultery and things up in there further, you know, about being put to death. There was a death penalty there in the Old Testament uh, under the law. The law was given to Moses. That's what's going on here. Uh, God is giving the laws to Moses and everything. And um, in this portion of Scripture, there is definitely the death penalty. Now, I need to say a few things here. Um, go back to verse 2, chapter 20, verse. well, we'll start in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Now the argument is made that it was not um, the government itself of ancient Israel that was putting people to death when there was perverts and whatever else, these other criminals. It was actually the people. Okay, I understand that. Okay, it wasn't a governmentally appointed executioner. It was the people themselves that they'd see this wickedness and they'd stone him with stones. But it was still under... A special system where God is dealing and speaking to those people and dealing with one nation. Truly one nation under God. So that's going to be important as we continue. Because the real question is, you know, what happened there? Should we be putting sodomites to death today? Okay, and other you know, people that commit adultery and whatever else. Let's go to the New Testament. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 26 and 27, it says here, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Okay, so God feels the same today in the New Testament as he did back there in the Old Testament in regards to sodomy. Men with men, women with women. The Bible does not use the term lesbian for two women. It just kind of falls under the umbrella of sodomy. Okay, um, you know, just give me one minute here. I got to shut something off over here. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, you know, there's not a thing where, okay, God was against, you know, what people would call today homosexuality in the Old Testament, but he's okay with it today. No, he's not. And anybody that, that uh, tries to pervert the clear teachings of the Bible against sodomy, um, you know, the LGBTQ, whatever other <laughs> letters they came up with today, anybody that tries to pervert the Bible and say, it's a, you know, the Bible actually is okay with it, no, it's not. Uh, they're lying to you. 
And uh, you know, it's 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 a sad life. It's it's not a good life. Okay, I've I've dealt with um, people that were gay, lesbian, whatever you want to call it, and uh, they get saved. They get out of that whole thing. It's a very dark path that you go down. If you're young, it might be so somewhat new and kind of exciting and everything else. Um, it's a path that's going to lead to sorrow. It's not God's design for you. I can tell you that. Okay, I don't. I never got into it myself, but I thank the Lord I didn't. But um, it's it's a bad thing. I could, you know, I've done other studies on it, so I'm not going to get into all that stuff right now. But what about the thing of the death penalty? Okay, we see God is still against them. It's you know gave them unto vile up unto vile affections. He calls it vile. Okay, women with women, men with men. What about the death penalty? Jump down to verse 32 in Romans chapter 1. Who knowing the judgment of God, you're going to answer to God for it, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now see, that's where I fell in. Because back when I was a porn addict, I would look at, you know, women and women together. Sorry, but that's what I would do. And uh, why? Well, because it's the nature of perversion. It has to get worse and worse as time goes by. Okay, it was sin. So under you know, that system there, I would have been worthy, just as worthy of death as the people that were actually doing the, the sin, the wickedness. Okay? You know, people don't often think about that. If you're going to say death penalty because God condemns sodomy here in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, and 32 says, verse 32 says that they're worthy of death, well, then you're going to have to kill the people that have pleasure in them too. Anybody goes to movies and sees sodomy and stuff on the, the big screen and whatever else, and it doesn't have to be full-on hardcore porn. It could just be in the movies. Anybody watches television show, you know, there's uh, some of these different TV shows that have sodomy and stuff like that. You have pleasure in that? Well, then you should be put to death, according to some of the people out there. Um, but let me show you the problem. Romans chapter 13 Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever there re therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that receive or resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Okay? So God appoints political rulers. It's funny, I saw that uh, Donald Trump here recently came out with this thing, like the last day or two, uh, the banning the, you know, transvestites or whatever, or transgender, I guess is the modern term, uh, people from being in the military because of all the problems that it, you know, makes. You know, that's, that's good, but people are all, oh, you know, it's terrible and everything else. How dare he? Yeah. And by the way, the elites in the whole New World Order structure, they want to push sodomy. Why? Because it's self-sterilizing. They want population levels to be brought down. All right? You need to think about that. It's eugenics. That's why they're so interested in the whole sodomite thing. Better think about that. But look at verse 3, Romans chapter 13, verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid, not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, to a, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now, here's the thing that you need to come away with this passage from. Does God appoint political rulers? Yes. Does that mean that they're all Christian? No. Did God put Adolf Hitler in Germany? Yes. What? He did. Is there anything in there saying that only good rulers are put in there by God? No. You know why? One of the reasons was that God put Hitler in power in Nazi Germany? Because the German people were wicked at that time. It's a terrible thing. God will give wicked people a wicked ruler many times as a form of punishment, as a form of his judgment. God puts political rulers in power. Okay? Doesn't mean that they're good or bad. He's not going to control them, you know, one way or the other. But compared to the Old Testament. 
See, in the Old Testament, you had a system where God is dealing specifically with one nation. And he puts in political ruler and he puts in the priesthood there, the Levitical priesthood. One tribe of the children of Israel, the Levites, and he says, okay, I'm going to deal through you. And then there's also other prophets and things like this. I'm going to deal through them. See? So God could say, hey, there's a religious connotation to the political system of the Old Testament. But not so in the New Testament. There are secular rulers. Now, how do you legislate? How do you get in there and say, okay, sodomites have to be put to death? You might get somebody to say, why? I don't understand why. Well, the Bible says, you know, and they'll go, well, I don't believe the Bible. See? And I'll tell you this right now. When you put that kind of power to execute people according to religious type spiritual things, um, that's dangerous. Like what the Roman Catholic Church did for, you know, over, well over a thousand years. They weren't going out and burning heretics. You know, why? Because they didn't agree with their system. Hold up the little wafer and the, and the glass of wine, you know, the little chalice of wine or whatever, and they say, is this the actual body and, and, uh, or the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ? And somebody say, no. Burn them. Burn the heretic. See, you can't invest that type of uh, power there uh, in, a, in a government today to you know, be able to execute people one way or the other. You can't do it. And you say, well, back in the Old Testament, it was the people that executed. Okay, again, try that one out. You know, First Baptist Church in whatever state, and they see some sodomites, and they say, okay, grab some stones, everybody. You know, and, uh, hit my microphone there. You know, and I'll start, you know, stoning the people. Now, how's that going to work? You know, the news media would have a heyday with that. Um, today, what has changed is you cannot have a religious political system that can put people to death. Right? Are they, you know, is, is sodomy is a crime that's so serious it's worthy of death? Yes, it is. And if you're a sodomite, you need to think about that. That's what God thinks of you. All right? I'm not saying that we should have laws to put these people to death because when does it stop, you see? And again, you invest the power to execute people, you know, in a government or even in the people themselves without God guiding that country and telling them what to do, that's very dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. Okay? And I'll give you another reason. Back in the Old Testament, you'll see over and over again, the soul that sinneth it shall die. When somebody sins in the Old Testament, it's actually called the soul sinning. Why? Well, because the flesh and the soul were basically sticking to each other. That's why you had a lot of the laws in the book of Leviticus. You're not to touch any unclean thing or don't touch this or don't touch that. Why? It would defile the soul. So a sodomite in the Old Testament, when they're committing their sodomite acts, it's affecting the soul. They're connected. In the New Testament, it still is, it still is affecting your soul. It's affecting everything about you, you know. But when you get saved, something happens. You actually have a circumcision made without hands, whereby the sins of the flesh are cut away from... You know your soul. Let me read that. Uh, second, or excuse me, yes, yeah, second. No, Colossians, the first Colossians. You know, not the second Colossians. <laughs> Saul, chapter two, Colossians, chapter two, verse eleven uh, through thirteen, it says here, "In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircum uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Unless you're Stephen Anderson or one of his little Baptist cult members that hates people that are involved in sodomy. While working with the Hollywood producer that was involved in sodomite films. Figure that one out, you know. But the fact is, in the New Testament, you can be forgiven from all sins. And all the ways that you defiled your body and just, just darkened your soul and just ruined yourself, spiritually speaking, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves into your body and He just goes, and He cuts out. 
see your body is made up of three aspects okay spirit soul and then your body of flesh you are not looking at my soul or my spirit right now all you see is my body but inside I have a soul and I have a spirit all right again another study but the fact is when I sin now if I touch it says the you know say that you know the, the Lord says uh, don't touch uh, um, the bookshelf and I go okay Lord oh I, I Oh, I touched it. Now what do I do? Well, I'll get punished for, you know, understand my little analogy here. I get punished for doing something I shouldn't have done. I get punished for sinning and touching something. But it doesn't affect my soul. Why? Because there's a circumcision made without hands. That's why. All right. If you've been involved in sodomy, I mean, I did a study recently on Jeff Dahmer. Jeff Dahmer got saved after committing horrible, horrendous acts. I mean, not just sodomy, not just, you know, homosexual relationships. He would kill his victims and cut them up in pieces and eat parts of their body. Okay, 17 young men he did it to before they finally caught him and put him in prison. In prison, he got saved, genuinely saved. And again, watch my study on that. Um, you can get saved. You're, uh, you can be forgiven, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, two things that you need to understand. Number one, imputation. The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ comes upon you when you get saved. When God says, okay, I'll save you, right? His righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his sinless, perfect life that he lived on the earth is given on your account. So you get before God to be judged. The Lord looks down and he says, okay, all I see is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what about all those wicked things I did? Paid for at the cross. Paid in full. You know? I'll give you a little story just to kind of illustrate my point. I remember when we were moving here, uh, we had rented a U-Haul truck to, to bring things up, and I had to get a trailer and to put my truck pickup truck on it and everything else. And it was like a big deal. Moved up in January, driving through snow, you know, icy roads and things. A lot of fun. And we got up here, and um, they misprinted something on the receipt or whatever or on the you know not well, i guess you'd call it the receipt the paperwork and it looked like i owed like this extreme huge amount of money and i'm just like you know he prints the thing out and he hands it to me and i'm just like what's this here and he's like oh man and for a minute i'm just going like i'm thinking in my mind i don't have that much money left i just like we spent all of our money buying the place up here and then like you know moving here and i'm like I can't pay my bill. You understand? I can't pay this. I don't have that kind of money. And he looks at it and he goes, oh, no. He goes, I'm sorry about that. He goes, no, you, you don't know anything. You know, I'd already paid, prepaid, way, you know, back down. But the point is, he just said, no, you don't know anything. And I felt my tension level go <gasps> to, oh. I was like, oh boy, I was like, that scared me half to death. And, he, and the guy laughed and he was like, oh, sorry about that. And I was like, oh, it's, it's okay, you know. I'll get my heartbeat back down to normal eventually. But you know what? When you get saved, you look and you see this long debt list. Sinned here, did that wrong, said that wrong, thought this wrong. Huge list of sins that you've done. And you start to sweat and you go, oh man. How can I pay this? Lord says you can't. What on earth am I going to do? Find somebody to pay your debt? Who would do a thing like that? Jesus Christ. Paid for it on the cross. You get saved. His righteousness becomes your righteousness. Your sinful life goes to Him on the cross. He died. Paid for it. Paid in full. Wonderful promise. But then the second part of that thing is your soul is cut loose from your body of flesh. So now when you touch unclean things, it doesn't affect your soul. Oh, wow, then I could get saved and just continue on in sin? You're not going to think that way when you, when you come to the end of yourself. All these people are, oh, eternal security is a damnable doctrine. You know why they say that? Because they're not done with their sins yet. They're not done with their flesh they want to hold on to their flesh. 
see? And they look at you and they try to judge you. They say, oh, that's not fair. You mean to tell me that you could touch that, that sinful thing and not be killed for it, not lose your salvation? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I just can't believe in that because they believe in their own righteousness. I've dealt with these people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, they're working hard to get to heaven, boy. You know, don't you dare tell me it's a free gift. Don't you dare tell me that. You know. So, that's the answer to the question there. Uh, what happened? Old Testament to New Testament. Well, God was dealing with one nation under God. You know, the political and the religious system. God is dealing with them in particular. So, he can say, hey, if the people don't stone these sodomites or stone these adulterers or whatever else, these bestiality people or whatever other incest, whatever. If you don't do that, then I'm going to judge you. God sat as a judge over the nation of Israel. And there were times when the people were wicked and the ruler kept his mouth shut. And God said, okay, I'm going to send plagues on the people. God was dealing supernaturally with one nation. Today, that's not the case. And if you invest in the government, if you invest in the government the ability to put certain people to death, you get somebody bad that comes into office next and they say, hey, you know what? I hate Christians. I hate Bible-believing Christians. Guess what they're going to use their powers of condemning people to death to do? You see? See how the thing works? Well, then it should be invested in the people. Again, how's that going to work? You get enough people in the neighborhood that don't like you as a Christian, Let's stone them with stones. You see? It's not going to work. God's not dealing with any nation in particular right now. He's not doing it that way. So that's what changed. Again, when you go from Old Testament to New Testament, you have to look and see there will be things that are in the Pauline epistles that are carryovers from the Old Testament. There are some things that don't change. There are some things that very obviously do change. Dietary laws are another one. You know, you can't eat this animal or that animal or that animal because they're unclean. Not true anymore. Right? There are many, many things like that. So that's why you compare Scripture with Scripture. And you get people that are sloppy, that are non-dispensational. They say, the whole book, Genesis to Revelation, the whole thing is mine at all. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So hopefully that's answered the question. Um, uh, are sodomites worthy of death? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They absolutely are, according to the Word of God. Should they be killed by secular authorities? No. Should they be killed by people that are, that are professing Christians? No. They should be witnessed to. Um, why? Again, Old Testament system, the soul that sinned died. New Testament, you can be the worst, most evil, horrible sinner, and the Lord can save you, and He can impute His righteousness to you, number one. And number two, He will sever, He will cut that, soul and that flesh separate from one another. So all the wicked stuff that you've done in your past, all those horrible things and the bad memories and the, oh, I just can't get this stuff out of my head, the things I used to do and oh, that stuff comes back once in a while. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it doesn't affect your soul anymore after you get saved. And you don't have to go on and live the rest of your time on earth messing around with those sins. Okay? So that is how I'd answer that question.